Well, welcome everybody to Coffee with Cluffy. Um, thanks for tuning in today. Thanks for supporting Cluffy. I'm proud to introduce my son as a presenter today. Uh, I think we've got a great topic, an interesting topic. We'll do a couple little housekeeping slides here and we'll get, uh, get right into it. So this is an important topic that we've got today. So pay attention. This is a I think the direction the industry is uh, headed with this electrification initiative that a lot of areas are starting to engage. So, um, yeah, just some facts and uh, questions and, uh, and information if you're having trouble with the webinar. Sometimes it's a connection issue. If you're having video or audio problems, sometimes if you log out and log back in, that'll fix it. There's a tech support number for, uh, for go to webinar. It's not for us. So if you have uh, problems with it, you can call and get their help also. And yes, this will be uh, recorded and you can listen at a later date. It usually takes us two or three days to get this um, uh, converted and put up on our YouTube channel, so it'll be available. And if at the end you check a box, you'll get a uh, certificate of attendance that you're here today. So sometimes you can use that for some of your credits for uh, your licensing and stuff, but um, we're glad to send it along with your name on it, of course, not mine. <laughs> All right. What else we've got here? Yeah, we're still tooting our horn on the uh, Innovation Award that we got from the HR Expo for our Angle Mix Valve, the 2021 winner. So um, if you haven't tried that valve, by uh, all means get one of those and put them in. I think you'll be impressed with uh, how well that Angle Mix works. All right, what else we have? Okay, some important information about hydronics. If you are, or if you do want to get these mailed to you, hard copy, we're glad to mail these out for free. You have to go and register at our website. And every so many years, we kind of go through that list and we purge it out. If we haven't heard or interacted with you in a couple years, uh, your name might fall off the list. So if you've been getting these and they stop showing up in the mailbox, just go back to the Cluffy website and um, register again, and we'll make sure that you're on the mailing list and um, that they keep coming to you in a timely fashion. So there's number 29, should be out on the street. So uh, that'll be our next webinar, by the way, too, on heat exchange. This one's gonna be um, up on the site in a, a couple of weeks, actually. I think we just finished the revision. Yeah. So this one's just around the corner. Exactly. The digital um, issue of this will be on the site. It'll so it'll be available as a hard copy if you want it mailed to you. Still a PDF if you go to our website. And now we're doing a digital um, uh, format of it also. So three different ways you can get to it. So um, yeah, there we are for the next one. Uh, Siggy's going to be back with us um, doing the um, Hydronics 29 topic heat exchangers. That's pretty interesting on different ways on different types of heat exchangers and stuff. So you'll you'll want to tune in for that one. Put it on your calendar. And um, yeah, there's a, you know, how you can get to the hydronics. That's the uh, direct uh, address right into hydronics. All right, with all that, thanks Max for putting this together. I know we put a lot of time and energy into this and we do encourage questions as we go along. You can type them in, Cody, me, uh, some of the other teams on the other end in Milwaukee and different places watching the questions. If it's a question uh, that's important to the topic or the slide that we're on, Cody will interrupt Max and say, okay, this is a, a good question that we have. So um, uh, yeah, somebody asked about the uh, that intro too. Uh, is that available, Cody or Mary, that people can go to our website and watch it? I don't know. That's I, a good I thought the intro was available on YouTube. I, I think it's it's been up there, but I'd have to double check again. But yeah, like Bob said, if you guys have questions, is, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you have questions, don't hesitate to type them into that questions bar. We want to make sure that we answer everything that we can. If we don't get to you during the webinar, we'll definitely get back to you afterwards for sure. But uh, yeah, yeah. as much as we can during the webinar without slowing it down too much. So then everybody that's tuned in today, you know, gets to see, you know, the question and the answer. So um, without burning up any much, any more time here, Max, take it away. I think. Okay. Anymore. So I love this topic. I think that it's a, a really important topic that is pushing the industry forward um, and for the better, whether or not electrification is the perfect fit for your location or uh, if it's something that may need a little bit more work, we'll kind of talk through some of those uh, limitations or some of those uh, opportunities throughout the webinar. And um, I think that we're gonna make this as interactive as possible. So we talked about the uh, typing in the questions. We're also gonna have five different polls throughout the webinar too. So you can uh, kind of uh, let us know how you feel about these different topics as we're clicking through the slides here. So to give you a little bit of a background of what we are going to talk about. So electrification, uh, as far as what's happening now, what's happened in the past, adoption trends, advantages, disadvantages, and common ground. One of the interesting things about electrification is the, the more research that I was doing. Uh, electrification was used as a term 
to describe when they were just trying to get electricity to the United States, to the rural parts of the United States before people had power. And I think that that was like an FDR era project to make sure that people had electricity so that uh, the further you look back in the archives, that may have been <laughs> electrification in a different era. So the next thing that I want to go through is there is a lot of jargon, there's a lot of buzzwords um, related to this topic and they kind of overlap to some extent. So uh, I pulled some of the specific terms from NREL, so electrification, the substitution of electricity for a direct combustion uh, fossil fuels, basically. So this would be going from an internal combustion engine to an electric car like a Tesla or something like that. Carbon neutral, so no net climate impact resulting from carbon or greenhouse gas. So carbon neutral is a tricky one, because this is not a carbon neutral event. Everybody has computers that are plugged into uh, electricity. There are servers running somewhere that are you know, streaming all of this. So if you are sleeping in a sleeping bag and you know foraging for food, maybe that's carbon neutral. But other than that, it's harder to uh, get to that as far as the context of buildings, but it is something that we'll talk about a little bit more. So zero emissions uh, produces as much emissions-free renewable energy as it uses. So that may still mean that you have propane running something in the basement, but you've got a bunch of solar or something too. Pretty tricky to get to that point uh, without going off site. Uh, and then a zero energy building would be, uh, you're gonna greatly reduce the load through energy efficiency gains and then also supply renewable technology. So whether or not uh, you know all of that is on site in the first three, versus the last one, maybe you have as much solar as electricity that you're using, uh, and that could be part of a zero energy building. So why is this happening? So big picture here, buildings account for 39% of total US energy consumption, and about half of that is going to be in your mechanical room. So it's gonna be space heating, it's gonna be air conditioning, uh, and then also uh, domestic hot water and things like that play a big role. So if you think about of the energy we use in the United States, that maybe 20% of that is just sitting in, you know, is rattling away in the mechanical room of the building that you're in right now. Uh, and the opportunity that we have is that the people on this call, I looked through the attendee list, um, we are a very smart, very capable group of doing that better. <laughs> so we can make those machines in the mechanical room uh, a lot more efficient without sacrificing comfort. That's one of the things that I really love about this industry is that we can do both of those things and be part of this. Uh, you know, I think the big goal here is to reduce the amount of energy that we use as uh, as a world, as you know, Canada and the U.S. and all over the world, uh, and then also still be able to have a functioning economy that we need. We can't just stop using power and you know turn off the power plants today. We need that, but we need to be more efficient with it. So building electrification is a shift from gas appliances to all electric. So in my house, that might mean that I you know, turn off the gas coming into the building. I've got an election, uh, electric induction stove. Uh, everything is electric resistance or a heat pump. Uh, and I'm not using any gas even for the, the barbecue out back or something like that. So it's a big ask in some cases, but it is a shift. So we'll, we'll talk about kind of the path to get there. Uh, it's one path to, to zero uh, carbon with no on-site carbon dioxide emissions. So if you think of the uh, utopia cities that are in a film and like the uh, Wakanda from the Marvel movies or something like that, where there's not a, uh, there's no coal stack in the middle of it, there's no uh, diesel bus coming through town spewing fumes everywhere. I think that that is what some people uh, have in mind when they think of electrification. Uh, and in some cases, it's easy to do to just switch to an electric bus fleet inside of a major city or something like that. But big picture, it's harder to get rid of carbon everywhere. And we'll talk about where the carbon is actually you know, being emitted to. So a lot of this relates to great potential to integrate renewables, whatever the case is, wherever that may be. That's an enormous piece of the puzzle here. So to start off with, I want to ask the group, is an electrified building also a sustainable building? So I talked about some complex topics there. We're gonna take this to a very, very, very simple question. Uh, is an electrified building also a sustainable building? Looks like we got the votes coming in here, Max. Uh, we'll give it just a, a little bit here. 
Um, and then while the votes are coming in, we've got a question about uh, living in central Alberta, where it can get really cold, negative 30 C, for example, will electrification be a viable option there? So that's a great question, and that is one of the things that is uh, potentially a limitation. So um, are electrified buildings also sustainable? So kind of close to a 50-50 split, but 60% saying no. And uh, to some extent, I would say that uh, I agree with that. An electrified building that hasn't made any more substantial upgrades uh, to the envelope and things like that isn't inherently sustainable. So uh, just switching the fuel source but still being a wasteful um, you know, house isn't going to get you there. So let me switch back over to the slides here. But that was kind of good to see where everybody is to start with. Okay, so I've got an example. I used to live in the Washington DC area and uh, there was an initiative and it's called Clean Energy DC to decarbonize DC. So let's say this is our baseline. So we've got throughout DC, obviously nothing's to scale here. <laughs> we've got a bunch of buildings with uh, natural gas hookups. They've got gas boilers in the basement. They're using it for domestic hot water and space heat, but a lot of little point sources everywhere. And then way out in West Virginia, there's a coal plant that's sending power down to the city to run everything else, to keep the lights on and things like that. So that's our baseline. So in a decarbonized DC, what if we're down to just a couple things in the city limits of Washington DC that are actually burning fuel? There is actually a power plant that's kind of by the Supreme Court, uh, a, coal, a coal and natural gas now power plant that's burning away there. Uh, they would get rid of that. They would just have, you know, potentially, I'm not the, the policy expert here to see what happens in each one of these cities, but they're gonna be down to a smaller number of gas, natural gas burning, propane burning, whatever, buildings inside the city limits. What that would mean is they would now have to burn a lot more coal in West Virginia in order to do that. So it's, it's definitely a not in my backyard type argument that just switching the fuel source in the city limits of DC, that it's a, it's a square city basically, they don't have, it's not like uh, Chicago where they've got the entire rest of the state of Illinois that they could cover in wind and solar and offset. Uh, they don't have enough roof space to generate the renewable energy just with solar. They don't really have huge wind potential. They could do some more creative things with geo and things like that, but it's wall-to-wall -wall city for the most part, and they don't have just fields of, uh, of open space to install local renewables within the district. So the decarbonized DC could mean that if you are you know, downstream of the power plant in West Virginia, you may be getting more carbon. <laughs> so uh, just the switch right there uh, doesn't necessarily solve problems for everyone, it just moves them further away. And in some cases that you know may be desirable by the millions of people that are in this area and the people out here aren't as, you know they don't have as many votes and it's not as big a deal. But just moving it doesn't necessarily uh, fix the problem. So I wanna talk about that a little bit more. And I know that that Clean Energy DC group is, a, is aware of that and they're working uh, on ways to make buildings more efficient and, and things like that too, that it's not just a kick carbon out and let somebody else worry about it. But in a, in a nutshell, those are two scenarios for what a decarbonized DC could look like. So I won't be able to cover all of the cities in, uh, in North America or in the world that are doing some sort of electrification initiative because it's a ton of research. It's a, it's a lot of cities you could just cover uh, different states in, uh, and it would take a whole hour, uh, if not more. So I wanted to highlight a couple things of some early adopters and a couple different ways that people are approaching this. So Vancouver by 2030, they're looking to uh, move space heating and domestic. Uh, they're not going to be bringing in uh, new natural gas and things like that. It's similar in Berkeley, California, he said, if you're building a new building, you cannot have a natural gas hookup. We're not going to do it. It's against the rules. That's how they're limiting that. It's spread to 40 other California cities that have something similar uh, in order to just locally get rid of the carbon. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, for a European example, plans to phase out fossil fuels in 95% of the country's homes by 2050, which is a pretty aggressive goal. Uh, and then Minneapolis, I think, is a little bit closer to the middle of the road here that they are 
trying to go to 100% renewable energy citywide by 2022, uh, but it's not quite as, uh, you know, drop uh, everything we're not doing natural gas anymore as, as Berkeley as an example. But then it is a, it's a huge spectrum. So in Texas, uh, one of the things, and I'll show the, uh, the source a little bit later here that you can look up each individual state, uh, they're not really that interested in electrification. And it doesn't mean they're not interested in energy efficiency. They just say utilities can't pay customers to switch from gas to electric. That's not something that we're interested in supporting, which is you know polar opposite from a, a Berkeley, California or something like that. Uh, so if you want to see kind of uh, a bigger picture of uh, what's going on state by state, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy will break this down by state. So you can see which states are supportive of electrification and which states are not that interested. Uh, but there's a ton of nuance here. So again, it doesn't mean that they're not supporting energy efficient uh, building or encouraging things in a different way. It just means there's not a you know, an incentive, maybe it's money and maybe it's it's not to stop using natural gas, fossil fuels locally. Okay, so my next question is, what is driving this? Why would some states decide that they love uh, electrifying everything and uh, they're gonna kick everything to Nevada and other states say, no, we're more than happy to keep burning gas here. Um, but we're going to try something different. So here are a few of many different things that may uh, drive the electrification adoption rate. And let's hear what uh, everyone has to say here. Yeah, it looks like the votes are coming in. I, I actually read an interesting article the other day, Max, about um, how a lot of the cryptocurrency miners are moving from China to Texas uh, mm -hmm. because of the low uh, energy costs there and yeah. everything like that, the low electricity costs, which is a really and, interesting thing. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of that uh, in the Northwest states too, uh, kind of uh, Washington and Oregon with low uh, kilowatt hour uh, rates. But that hurts. I mean, that's something that, that uses a lot of energy to run those oh, yeah. crypto servers. Uh, and that's something that, you know, how do you make an energy efficient building that's also mining Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it's a really complicated uh, thing. But 69% of the respondents said that this is a policy on a local or regional or federal level. 14% uh, energy prices and then 14% uh, accessibility to the power sources. Only 2%, 3% total say engineers, installers, or homeowners. So uh, in this webinar, this is definitely a policy thing and not so much uh, the people that are on the call. But I will kind of uh, play devil's advocate with that to some extent as we get further into the presentation, because I think that if you're on the call, you really have more uh, power than it would seem to make changes. And you can decide which changes you want to make. So maybe that's full electric and maybe that's uh, something that's a little different. So get back to my slides here. Let's call this the typical 2021 mechanical room. So you have, uh, you've got power coming from probably a coal plant, maybe it's a natural gas plant or nuclear or hydro, whatever it may be in your uh, neighborhood. You've got electricity coming from there and then you have a natural gas pipeline coming right to your neighborhood. Inside of the mechanical room, let's say this is high temp baseboard. You've got uh, you know a standard one speed pump, and then we'll call this a non condensing boiler. And that's not going to be every mechanical room, uh, obviously, but that's probably a bigger portion here. Or it's an inefficient furnace, an 80% piece of equipment, or something like that. That's kind of the baseline what we're starting with. So now, if we look at a 2030 mechanical room let's say at the utility level and at the policy level, they say that you have to have more renewables as part of the utility mix. So there's gonna be more solar or wind uh, coming from your utility. Maybe they're taking some coal burning power plants offline uh, and then you do not have natural gas coming to your house anymore. This is just a hypothetical. To keep up with that, Maybe that means that you have to have some PV locally. Maybe that's on your property or maybe that's somewhere in your city, somewhere a little bit closer. Maybe you're going to offset some of that carbon with solar thermal. Uh, inside your house, maybe you're going lower temperature heat emitters. So in this case, the, instead of the high temp baseboard, we've got low temp 
radiant, maybe these are ECM pumps, and then this could be an air to water heat pump, a water to water heat pump. In this case, I drew you know, geo. There's a lot of there's a lot of change that happened in nine years here. So, so I'll kind of cycle back and forth. Uh, does this look like a quick trip to Home Depot to anybody? Is this something you're going to be able to knock out in a weekend? Um, probably not. This is a this is a lot of work. This is I think theoretically what the you know, the building of the future looks like that could be electrified and is still providing you know, really excellent comfort. But there's a lot of work to do there. So uh, that's that's one of the things that we want to ask next is what is supplying the hydronic heating and cooling mechanical room of a new building in the year 2030. So we're not that far away from that. What do you think uh, is gonna be down in the mechanical room? Um, we'll just say in the building that you're in right now. So maybe it's a mix of commercial and, and residential, whatever you define as, as your building, we'll start there. Yeah, and while we're waiting for this, Max, too, we've had some good questions in here that are, I think, are going to be covered as we we come up uh, through the rest of the slides here and everything like that. But there's there's a lot of good thought and that's that's being uh, uh, brought up in in the questions box there. So we definitely appreciate your your thoughts there, guys. Yeah, and one of the things that has been a couple questions uh, have been related to this uh, are kind of grid related, and uh, can we do this switch? Okay, so I'll read through the results here. So non-condensing boiler, zero uh, percent. Uh, that that actually um, I, that makes me personally kind of happy. I think that we uh, we've got the technology uh, to move past that eighty percent piece of new equipment. Uh, mod cons, twenty three percent. Electric boiler, six percent. And then the big winner here is an air to water heat pump. So I'm also surprised about that, and I think that that's that's a pretty interesting thing moving forward. Um, heat pumps water to water, so maybe geo, 16%. So uh, you guys have, uh, I didn't know if these were all just going to be a complete, like <laughs> the same uh, number of respondents for each one, but those are those are interesting answers so far. So let's, uh, let's talk next about the grid. So this was from the uh, Energy Information Administration. If you're an energy nerd like me, you can really go down a rabbit hole on this website and find all sorts of data and get uh, very uh, sidetracked with uh, whatever else you are working on looking at where energy goes. So to break this down into a little bit easier uh, piece here. So of the things that are producing electricity to send to either an industry, transportation, residential or commercial, uh, all of the things that are consuming power, 65% uh, of that is loss. So let's say, theoretically, we go uh, all electric today. We snap our fingers and everything that burns gas, propane or natural gas or coal, uh, is now a renewable energy. It's all solar. We just paint the entire state of Nevada with solar uh, and nobody has to worry about anything, right? Well, according to this, we're still really limited and kind of hamstrung by the grid that if we lose 65% of that energy uh, to the system loss, that's a, that's a pretty big deal. So that doesn't even account for any of the things that might be wasteful with the end use sector. We're still uh, losing a lot between A and B, between that power plant in West Virginia and DC, uh, even if that power plant is replaced by the, you know, the biggest wind turbine that the world has ever seen. Uh, it doesn't necessarily fix everything. Electrification isn't the uh, one size fits all solution without some major upgrades to the grid. Or what I would argue is that if we're losing so much power between West Virginia and DC, we need more renewable energy. We need more power generated closer to the users, uh, but people don't like to put coal plants uh, in their backyard. That's why they're in less populated parts of the state that you live in probably. Uh, so people don't seem to mind as much having solar panels on the roof for something, but it's a lot more work. There's not just a single building that goes up and comes online and provides electrical power for the entire region like that. It's a lot of people doing a lot of things in order to bring more renewable power closer to these end use sector uh, pieces of the pie here. But that's going to be a really big piece of it. We either need to, again, snap our fingers and have a great uh, energy grid uh, across the entire, you know, I guess it's in the states, it's the western half of the states, the eastern half, 
and then Texas is its is its own. Um, all of those would have to be really good at you know sharing those electrons back and forth. If it's a windy day in Wyoming, could you get that without as much loss to DC to power uh, the city there that same day? Or if it's cloudy, do we have things to uh, accommodate for uh, the lack of solar that day? There's a lot to be figured out there. And I don't think that in any uh, realistic scenario, you can say that you would get rid of petroleum and natural gas and coal and even nuclear today. Um, those are what we call you know, stock limited resources. So they can kind of come to life to some extent to cover the flow limited resources, which would be renewable. So the, the flow of wind, the flow of uh, solar, of sun that day, if it's cloudy. So those are all pieces of the puzzle here that even before you plug anything into your house, all of this is happening in the background. Uh, but it's really something that would need to change drastically in order to uh, justify electrification. And um, people are working on it. I don't think that anybody who takes this seriously and is working on the policy uh, completely uh, underestimates that, but it's something that uh, is definitely a big part of it. So some electrification advantages, and go ahead and type in some other things that you can think of here, uh, and I'll have uh, Cody help me read some of those too. I'll just go through a couple of the uh, advantages that I had written down. Again, some, not all. <laughs> um, so the electric grid, according to the old electrification, we do have power at most of the homes in North America. You may not have a natural gas pipeline to your house. You may be on propane, uh, something like that, but you probably can plug in an iPhone and charge it at your house. Electricity can be generated with stock limited, like I said before, things that are buried in the ground that we have a certain supply of that we can dig up and burn. And then flow limited resources like uh, the sun uh, coming and hitting your solar panels. That is not something that you can uh, determine how many days are gonna be sunny. Your you know, state might get more sun than others. That might be a good place to put a solar panel, but it's not something you decide. So an electrification advantage would be no local point source pollution. So this goes back to my uh, you know, utopian city of Wakanda where there's not a single, <laughs> there's not a, a fire burning in the city and everything is quiet and, and pretty and there's no soot. And that is, I think, something that if you live in a city sounds great, but it's a not in my backyard thing to just say somebody else burned the coal. I don't wanna see a natural gas boiler in my city. So. Uh, if you're inside of a building, there's no combust combustible gas or carbon monoxide link leak potential in a mechanical room. These aren't things that I would say are you know uh, an epidemic uh, of of people dying because of this. I think that as an industry, we're pretty good at making sure the gas goes where it needs to go and there's no carbon monoxide leaking. But it is something that in an electrification case, uh, you could still get electrocuted, but you're not going to uh, have carbon monoxide poison you in your sleep or something. So, like I said before, less uh, smoggy and quiet. The cities that have switched to electric buses, uh, where it's just a quiet monorail pulling up to the, <laughs> the train stop instead of uh, you know a, a coal locomotive driving into town, uh, it is kind of nice. It is nice to be able to sit on a, a street and only electric cars are driving by if you're trying to have a conversation. Uh, and, but again, it's not the not the end all be all but it is something that I think if you live in a city can be uh, advantageous if you've never been able to say anything without shouting to your neighbor in, in 20 years. Uh, no combustion to analyze if you're installing boilers. Um, there's you know, some voltage work to be uh, verified and things like that, but it takes one of the steps out of the installation. Uh, I would say a big piece of this, and it seems like the attendees agree here is political momentum. So a lot of you said that policy is the driver here. Uh, electrification is the, the thing that Maybe people that don't have any idea how a mechanical room works think this is, you know, electrification is the one thing that we're gonna do and it's gonna fix everything and climate change isn't gonna be a problem anymore. And all of these things are just gonna be a, a, the flip of the switch and everything's electrified and everything's great. Uh, that is what people that are sitting in policy chairs may think. Uh, and hopefully they have a little bit more uh, nuance and realize some of the, the grid issues and things like that, but maybe they don't. So that's one of the, the pleas I'll kind of make at the end is that you on this call know how this works a little bit better and have some uh, ability to, to shift this. So heat pumps and electric boilers work well with low temperature hydronics. That's an advantage for us. We're not completely you know, dinosaurs out of the picture. 
we can change what's in the mechanical room and still deliver the same cool systems that we've been doing, uh, whether it's natural gas or electricity. So let's pause here and see what we have some. Oh man, we got a, a lot of questions. Yeah, we had a lot of here. good ones in here, Max. Uh, I've, I've got them down here, but uh, one of the things that was mentioned is that electrification has the potential to be cheaper at one of the advantages, and it's not tied to a single energy source either. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the fact that you could get it from PV, you could get it from you know, a, a power plant or whatever the case may be, but I would also caution you on that one too, because there are certain areas of the country where, you know, with a lot of hydro plants and stuff where electricity is a lot cheaper, you know, versus the Midwest west where the natural gas you know network is very strong you know and, and i can't imagine we're you know in the midwest we're going to be switching over as quickly as certain other parts of the country as well but um, yeah I don't know what your thoughts are there well and i, I was talking to uh, john siegenthaler uh, about this topic and uh, it also depends how far away from a city you are too so if you're on propane and uh, the propane buying situation isn't in your favor which it rarely is uh, that may be a very expensive thing to run your building all winter with propane, depending on the year and depending on the prices, where if you are electrified, uh, you could use any variety of energy sources at the utility level or, or whatever. Um, so it may, it's very hyper local here. It may be a no brainer cheaper to just do electrical resistance heating in your mechanical room. And then at the same time, if you live in a different state, it may be an absolute no-brainer to just continue to use natural gas. Um, so that's one of the, the bigger arguments here too. Uh, local batteries could maintain uh, heat during out outages. So definitely battery technology is something that is a huge missing piece here. There's kind of a weird thing in uh, Utah that there's this big salt cave basically that they fill with compressed air and it works kind of like a, a hydro um, that you can just release the air and spin a turbine and kind of uh, dial it up as you need more power as the renewables aren't catching on. There are not that many salt caves <laughs> that you could do that <laughs> in everybody's backyard. So uh, it definitely requires some creative battery uh, technology. So if anybody on the call knows something that we don't know, uh, get a patent on that and you can uh, you can live well on a, an electric yacht one day because we're missing that definitely. One of my favorite comments in here was uh, from a particular person and it must be an installer. Uh, they said that with the electrification that there's no venting to install. And I'll tell you what, having to run three or four inch venting for a boiler for PVC or CPVC, I would love it if I never had to do anything like that again. So I can I can definitely see that advantage, that's for sure. Yeah, there were, I sold uh, boilers as a rep for a few years and there were some buildings that were constructed around the boiler 50 years ago. And there was no new way to get yeah. <laughs> uh, equipment in there. You couldn't physically get the old boiler out without cutting in into pieces. And then yep. how were you going to replace it with, you know, four mod cons that were staged without some, you know, very complex, uh, you know, uh, venting system that you're uh, going to have to drag a bunch of PVC through that existing chase that may not be easy to do. So yep. I think that that is, uh, that's definitely something that makes installers' lives easier if you don't have to do the PVC. But again, it may not be a fit for your location. So um, let's see. Subsidies is one mention here, and that's another huge policy question that, depending on where you are uh, at the federal, state, or local level, they may have uh, very generous arrangements to continue using one power plant or the other. And I'm not even going to you know pick sides there. Maybe it's uh, they're demanding that we switch to electricity or they're just really, really uh, putting up a fence that we are not switching away from natural gas or you know, we frack in this area or we're a coal town or something like that. So it can go uh, either way with that. So let's look at a case study. Um, and I thought this was kind of a, a harder ask for uh, a building to go electric. So this was, and this isn't full electric, uh, but this is the St. Mark Hotel in Oakland, California. An old building, 1906, remodeled with 102 uh, subsidized housing units. So just in those first two bullets right there, that's a pretty tricky building to get really, really energy efficient. They had non-condensing boilers, replaced them with heat pumps, and then uh, with their modeling, uh, just the hot water uh, strategy, they're saying that they're gonna reduce energy 44% on site. 
So that's a pretty big deal. That's uh, that's something that I'd love to see under any circumstance, a big reduction in energy there, because it means that we were for 100 years wasting a lot of energy in that building that it wasn't making people more comfortable. We just know how to do it better without them knowing the, the issue. Uh, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't fix everything for everybody. There's still uh, some you know some things that wouldn't be ideal in this building, I'm sure. But it's a, an example of something that may not have seen may not have seemed uh, able to go electric, uh, but they made really good improvements there. So let me go to the other side of the argument here and talk about some electrification disadvantages. And we've covered a couple of these, but can a grid that's split into three different parts in the US handle the electrified house and garage? So now as people are getting Teslas and people are, uh, you know, they're the, I don't know what the stat is, but you know, you see more Teslas every single day. They're, I think it's one of the fastest growing car companies. Uh, that's not going away. The new Ford F-150 uh, Lightning electric truck, that might be coming to more garages. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Can the grid handle that? It, again, in a scenario where we snap our fingers and now everything's electric in your house, um, that's like uh, you'd snap your fingers and have an electric house and garage and you'd snap your fingers and have brownouts across the US. <laughs> it's just not quite ready for that. So is backup heat required? Uh, is, a good, is a heat pump going to cover 100% of your load if you are in uh, you know, kind of a warm uh, coastal city? Uh, Maybe, yeah, probably in a, in a lot of cases, if you're in Anchorage or something like that, there there might not be enough of the load that you can cover without having to have a backup boiler or something like that. So now you've got a, a more complex system because you've got two uh, power plants in your own building. It may still absolutely be worth it from the cost of operation if you're only turning on the propane for 10 days of the year instead of the entire heating season, it may still pencil out well but it is still a you know, two system house. Transmission losses we talked about in that, that chart. And then one of my things is not inherently clean to switch to electric. So where's it coming from? Is your Tesla just a coal powered locomotive? I think that the, you know, a car that can go zero to 60 in, in two seconds uh, is a coal powered locomotive for sure. That's still a lot of energy, whether or not that uh, has a tailpipe that has carbon monoxide coming out of it or not. Uh, it's still using a lot of coal or whatever somewhere. So another thing that's uh, for the, the contractors in the, the webinar here, uh, we have decades of experience with gas-based installations. So I would say that most of the people on the call would be able to install, even if you've installed natural gas boilers your entire career, you'd be able to install an electric boiler uh, or a heat pump. It's within our skill set. But as far as uh, being able to scale the amount of you to do that in every house in the U.S. to go electric, uh, it's a pretty big ask of a, of a stressed uh, workforce that is, you know, getting older and retiring. Now we're asking brand new people to start installing brand new equipment, uh, and there's going to be some some holdup there. That's going to cause us some issue in the installation and service world. And the people that know how to do it well. I would say are going to be able to you know charge uh, what they deserve to do that, um, and I think that that's not even uh, I think that that's fair if you have an entire career of experience and know how to install all sorts of mechanical rooms that shouldn't be uh, an issue. But uh, definitely homeowners aren't going to like it if they can't find anybody and the only person they can find is going to charge way more than they were expecting. It's not a copy and paste upgrade if you've got uh, an old non-condensing boiler. Uh, like I showed earlier, and uh, uh, baseboard, high temp, and you're going to electrify that. That's not something that you're going to do in an afternoon. That might require a little bit more upgrade with the heat emitters and things like that throughout the house too. So fossil fuel infrastructure, there are pipelines in place uh, to most cities, uh, let's say excluding California, Berkeley now, that they're not going to take new fuel service to these places. Uh, they can't decide in 10 years that they, oh, we need natural gas, actually. That, that's going to take, uh, that may, there may not be any way to do that again. They've, they've lost the flexibility to go back to gas. Uh, hopefully, as a, as a country and as a world, we wouldn't transition back to fossil fuels. I mean, I think the idea here is that we leave some of this fossil fuel in the ground and use it 
more sparingly for the things that can't be done with anything but natural gas. Maybe that's the, the peaker plant that comes online to keep California from browning out or something like that, but maybe we don't need to use natural gas for everything all the time or coal for everything all the time, I think is kind of the general direction here, uh, but you lose some of the ability to switch to uh, natural gas equipment if, uh, if you do need it, if the infrastructure is gone. So another thing that I haven't seen anybody who said at the policy level, you need to rip out that gas boiler, you're getting an electric boiler tomorrow. I don't think anybody's that aggressive with it, but there are some cases that a ModCon, uh, you know, 15 years from now, that may still have some functional life left. May be, uh, it may be financially advantageous to throw that in the landfill, uh, and that would also be kind of wasteful. So there's no reason that if if something is very energy efficient, it may not be the the boiler that you would install if you built the house again today. But if it's working well, uh, we should probably leave it in place, and. It, I'm not going to say 100% on that because I know that there are some cases that you should go down to your mechanical room and rip out that boiler right now <laughs> and replace it with something, uh, a heat pump or whatever instead. So what are some other uh, disadvantages we got in the... Uh... I, think, I think you hit a nerve with this one, Max. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> That's kind of the point of this webinar. I don't know that we're going to settle on anything here, but hopefully there's more yeah. uh, food for thought yeah. at the end of it. Max was just out to push everybody's buttons, but uh, yeah. one of the biggest thing here was the the cost of electricity versus versus gas. And you know, one one person mentions the cost of natural gas, and their region is ten times cheaper than electricity per unit or per yeah. unit, per the same amount of energy. And and I, I mentioned the same thing in the Midwest. I mean, natural gas is so abundant and cheap uh, that it's it's a lot of times hard to over overlook or look past, especially if you have it. Um, from there, uh, another one uh, about Texas with the grid collapse in Texas during all those storms, you know, how can we provide infrastructure that is reliable even, uh, and especially in extreme conditions, you know, um, yeah. that, that's, that's a big one. I mean, I think in California and Texas, as much as you know, some people might think that electrification today is going to fix everything, there would have been some very, you know, cold houses in Texas without a propane tank in your backyard. Uh, or something like that. Um, so it's definitely a transition. It's not going to be something that happens right away. But I think that to, and I'm sure that this won't be popular with everybody on the call, but uh, clean energy doesn't really come from the combustion of anything. Clean energy doesn't come from fire. I think that a natural gas appliance can burn very clean. And I think that we can get you know even better at that. We can make combustion uh, as as good as we you know theoretically can, uh, but it is still you know burning uh, a fossil fuel, and there is a, a carbon penalty for that. Uh, again, I'm not saying that there isn't with electricity. I think that the bigger thing that we're going to talk about in a little bit is the the overall efficiency of uh, of buildings is something that's more in our wheelhouse. So I'll talk about the you know the counter case study here. So. The grid goes out on a regular basis. It goes out for days at a time. This is a residence in uh, in California. So for resiliency, it's important to have propane backup. And this isn't even some uh, you know architect or engineer that doesn't care about energy efficiency. This is the they're building a net zero home with propane. Um, so that is something that you know regional considerations may not allow you to live in a house that's going to operate perfectly just relying on on the grid so having that propane to keep your house from freezing may be realistic for a lot of people on the call today maybe in your area that that's not an issue if you're close to a hydro dam or something that you're not experiencing brownouts like other parts of the country uh, but this building can be really energy efficient and have you know clean burning propane uh, inside of the you know a tank somewhere there and then just use less of it, and I don't think that that's a bad answer. So I don't want to say uh, that you need to uh, close your you know, propane tank valve and natural gas today. I don't think that that's realistic for everybody, but I think that uh, a net zero energy home is cool under any circumstance. <laughs> and I think that that's probably my bigger argument is that uh, that's that's where I would like to see the the world go is just more energy efficient. So let's ask do you think your city will go electric in the next 20 years so this would mean wherever you're getting power from 
in the city that you live in, big or small, are they going to say no more fossil fuels and we're just doing electric anytime in the next 20 years? So yeah, we're getting the votes coming in, Max. And it just reminded me too, you know, like when I was still in, in the trades and everything like that, there was a lot of houses that were built in the 70s and including the house that I currently live in that went all electric yeah. because of a lot of incentives. And it was amazing when I was still in the field, how many of those houses we were taking back to gas, you know, in, in the Midwest because natural gas had just become so much cheaper at that point. And there was no more incentive for being all electric, like time of day rates or anything like that. And uh, and so, yeah, there's there's a there's a lot of moving pieces to this puzzle. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely. Uh, I got a hard no from Fairbanks, Alaska, as far as <laughs> <laughs> one of the chats there. So, do you think uh, your city will go all electric? 63% say no, and 38% say yes. So, I would say that that's almost a little surprising that that many people say yes in in 20 years. Uh, I think that it is. We have a lot of work to do on the grid side uh, to be able to do that, uh, but. Um, you know, 20 years, 50 years, maybe it's a, a different answer, or maybe it, you know, it never happens depending on the area that you live in. It just isn't feasible in Fairbanks uh, or something like that, that, you know, if you're going to live at a, you know, coastal Alaskan uh, fishing retreat, uh, no one's bringing a power line to your house. <laughs> it's accessible by, uh, by plane only, and that's going to be a limitation. I don't think there's ever a hundred percent electrification scenario, but there are a lot of houses uh, that could go either way, I think. All right, let's come back over here. Okay, I've got another question for your house. You have to choose, you have to move today. And house B is a gas boiler with major envelope upgrades. So really tight building, high R value in the attic and in the walls. Or house B is an electric heat pump, but it's an older building. Uh, no upgrades to the structure at all. They've just switched from gas to electric. Uh, that's uh, that's all they've done. So we'll throw it back to the audience for a poll here. Which of those houses do you move into? You have to move into one. It's an A or B choice here. This question came up uh, quite often in the replacement of of heating equipment and things like that when I was in the field as well. So this is a this is an interesting one. And then, yeah, the uh, another mention of um, battery technology that that whether it's in your house or uh, whatever you're using to store electrons, or like I said, you know, pumped hydro, or uh, if you're storing uh, compressed air, whatever the battery technology is, that's going to take so much pressure off of the grid and such a uh, important piece of this. So, okay, this is a pretty uh, pretty overwhelming response that 86% of you would rather have a tight house, uh, tight envelope gas boiler. And I think that that uh, is, I think that that's really important. I mean, if I were going to answer the, the question myself, I would probably go that direction too, that you could switch to electricity later with that really tight envelope building. But the, the structure itself is so much more important than the heat source in a lot of cases. And then you still have the flexibility to switch if energy prices change or if you decide that you just don't want to burn carbon on site uh, for you know, whatever motivation. But uh, yeah, that, that's a, an interesting answer there. Okay. Now, let's look at another uh, EIA set of charts here. So on the left and the top here as of 2020 we'll kind of talk through some of the the many many details here as of 2020 this is energy consumption by energy source so across all different sectors this isn't just for buildings it's going to be transportation and things like that 35 percent petroleum 34 percent natural gas nine percent uh, nuclear ten percent coal and then 12 percent renewable energy so there is a long way to go, you know, beyond electrification, all of these sources can provide electricity. But if we're now targeting as some cities and municipalities and, and uh, you know, nations are targeting to go zero carbon, uh, there is a lot of expansion needed in renewable energies in order to have smaller pieces of all of these different, uh, you know, stock-based resources. And, you know, nuclear may be a piece of that, uh, that isn't uh, you know, burning uh, coal or petroleum or a fossil fuel per se, 
but it hasn't, at least in the U.S., hasn't really taken over as the, the energy source in the last few years. Um, you know, places like France went all nuclear a long time ago, but even there it has slowed down. So one of the things that could be an absolute game changer along with battery technology would be uh, a way to really uh, keep reusing uh, plutonium or, you know, the, the fuel that you would need for a nuclear power plant over and over again so it's not so uh, wasteful to have to store something for a thousand years underneath the mountain. Uh, if we could find a way to process that uh, more efficiently i forget what the like the next phase the next generation of nuclear plants that would be able to do this better is that's still you know in the process that could be a huge game changer there otherwise you have to squeeze all these other pieces of the puzzle to get to zero carbon uh, and we're starting at 12 percent at least last year so uh, a lot of work to be done there and then it kind of along the same you know argument that we had with the house is this graph on the bottom right here is primary, primary energy consumption by major sources from the 50s to last year. So up and up and up and up, flattens out a little bit, and then this may be a COVID thing, I'm not sure. I don't think that there were that many energy efficiency gains in that last year, maybe there were, that there was a pretty big nosedive in the amount of energy consumption uh, across all sources. I would argue that this little drop right here, this trend, to use less energy is probably vastly more important than where the energy comes from as far as the sources. So all of these different lines here, you know, in the future, maybe there's a lot more green, there's a lot more renewable, uh, but ideally there's less of everything. And I think that, like we talked about at the very beginning, if we just run buildings more efficiently with whatever's in the mechanical room, that's going to take the stress off, off of everything else. It's gonna, you know, put less strain on the electric grid, we're not going to need as much fuel of any type in order to keep people comfortable in their homes. And I think that that big picture is something that even if you answered that the policymakers were the ones that determine this type of thing, uh, for a lot of you later today or tomorrow uh, are going to design or install uh, a system in someone's mechanical room that could play a big part in this, in that you know, dropping of the amount of power that we're using uh, as a nation to bring that down is is really a huge a huge completely underestimated piece of this you know fuel type conversation is whatever it is we need to use less of it so uh, again you can get buried in in those uh, EIA graphs if you want to so to have some specific kind of recommendations here and I hope that there's some common ground to be found here uh, that water is uh, definitely the best way to move energy around a building. So water can hold 3,500 times as much heat as the same volume of air. So whatever's in your mechanical room, electric resistance, a heat pump, uh, a non-condensing boiler, someone stoking coal in a, in a fire downstairs, if you're moving energy around that building, heating and cooling with water, maybe it's through radiant, maybe it's just to you know water to a fan coil or something like that, uh, it's the best way to move that energy once you've already paid for it, you've already burned that you know, nugget of coal or a little bit of natural gas or um, the electricity that's powering it. How do we not waste that moving it throughout a big building or a small building? And uh, water is the best vessel to do that. So that's the, the common ground here is I think that hydronics really spans this entire argument. It's something that works well with air to water heat pumps, water to water electric boilers, mixed gas and electric plants, whatever's making warm water, we can use that to make people comfortable and to move it around the house really well. For a bunch of great examples um, and some you know, more technical diagrams of how to do that, this hydronics number 25 is one of my favorites. And it applies to that house question that do you move into a, a house that has a cast iron boiler that's uh, you know very old, running uh, inefficiently, and a bunch of baseboard, high temp. Uh, now what? Now how can I get this house to be more efficient? And lowering the water temperature is you know the, the simplest answer that I can give uh, in order to reduce the consumption there and the amount of waste, uh, regardless, again, of what's in the mechanical room. So that's a great read. Uh, and something that you can refer to if you're looking for a specific takeaway for, okay, show me an example that uh, that Hydronics 25 is, is a great place to start. So if you wanna know more about, definitely the a big answer was policy, 
Uh, Kathy Higgins at New Building Institute is a, is a woman to follow. Uh, her group does a lot of this policy research that uh, helps uh, shape the, the conversation, and they do a good job of figuring out what's realistic, what is a, a good path forward, lots of case studies, lots of background. Uh, we're actually going to have a New Buildings Institute uh, speaker come on uh, later this year uh, in November. I got a confirmation yesterday from them. Uh, so that'll be good because according to the the group you want to hear more about the you know what is happening on a policy level and that's definitely kathy and, and her group uh shaping that uh in the bay area adrian johnson with point energy innovations they're doing a lot of electrification stuff that i think is interesting center for the built in uh, environment gail uh her group is excellent not so much on the electrification side of things that's not their motive as, as much as how do we make buildings better and more energy efficient kind of uh, beyond just the, the fuel source piece of it. Uh, but that's a, a great resource. And then if you're ready with your zip code and you want to go to this uh, dsire.org, you can type that in and find uh, incentives and rebates in your area that would apply to this conversation. So if you're in New York, you might be able to get a, you know an incentive to switch to geo. And I forget 15 or $1,300 a ton or something like that to, to switch to geo, that may be something that's interesting. But regardless, it's probably a good thing to see what policies are in place from uh, local, federal, and your uh, utility company even. You can type in a zip code and you'll get some answers there. So one of the things that I think uh, outside of what we do day to day that will be telling in this electrification conversation is, is a truck like the Ford F-150 Lightning an all electric truck like a you know tesla truck is that going to be popular and is it going to be popular all the way across uh, the us and canada is someone in northern alberta or someone in texas or kansas going to buy this truck or is it going to be uh, more of a you know coastal city that people are like to drive the the cool new truck but it's not really something that catches on everywhere if the electric truck becomes something that makes more sense, is uh, is efficient, uh, it works for kind of the, the whole blue collar nation and lots of other companies start to do that. I think that that is going to push this electrification concept into houses probably more than the things that uh, we may decide to do every day, that, that that really is a motivator that if people say, I need that truck, I need an electric truck of some sort, and are willing to upgrade the power service coming into their house potentially that truck requires a 80 amp service uh, and if you're going to do that plus uh, go to a you know air to water or water to water heat pump uh, you may need some more uh, you may need to bring in additional electric service or have a sub panel depending on your house uh, there's a little bit more surgery required there. If people are willing to do that for the truck, then maybe they'll be you know, willing to spread that electrification further out through the country, and maybe not. Maybe the electric trucks and the electric cars are popular in, in cities, uh, but the further away from the cities that propane and a gas-powered truck are still going to be the way to go. If the trucks are more fuel efficient and if the houses are more fuel efficient, uh, I don't think that that's a bad answer. I think that's a probably a realistic thing that is uh, is possible, but it will be interesting just as kind of a bellwether thing to see if that, that Ford truck uh, really catches on and maybe that's an indicator that electrification could make it further away from cities. Hey Max, on that one, um, that DSIRE, it's DSIREUSA.org, we'll get you directly there. Okay, yeah, and then I think that uh, it will believe that they're Canadian numbers in there too. But yeah, if you're in the States, uh, USA is going to be the one that you want to use. Okay, so we'll go through um, how this affects you uh, directly if you want to start typing in some answers there. And then, uh, so in summary, distribution and efficiency and building envelopes to me are very key to this regardless of the fuel type. It's going to be electrification, electrification will fit some places better than others. The global equipment industry is changing. So if you are currently installing a boiler that comes from Europe and all of Europe decides they're done with natural gas burning boilers, things will change. And maybe the, you know, the price that you pay for a boiler coming from another part of the world that doesn't use boilers anymore will change. Uh, it was a similar thing with the uh, ECM pumps. The ECM pumps came down in price because Europe was like, 
you cannot do single speed pumps anymore. <laughs> We're, you can't build them here. It's a light bulb. We, uh, it's like an incandescent light bulb. You can't have that anymore. We're not gonna build them anymore. And if the only market is then the US, then it may make more sense to switch to these other technologies just because the, you know, the manufacturers have decided that they're not in the business of doing uh, you know, 80% uh, natural gas appliances anymore. That could happen. That could be something that pushes this whole argument one way or the other. Uh, the workforce is changing, like I mentioned. Uh, and then there's there's no single fuel type that's going to work for all areas. But if we make buildings better, which I know that the people on this call can do, uh, it's going to reduce the stress on on all of this until we have the battery and grid technology to have more options potentially. So let's see what we've got in the chat here. Yeah, there was quite a few of them there. Um, just in regards uh, with space planning, uh, when you're doing the architectural stuff, like you know, mechanical rooms never seemingly get bigger. Uh, as we all know, they get smaller and smaller, and and uh, and being able to do this stuff with whether it be battery backup or or whatever the case may be, it, it's probably going to need more space in some cases. Yeah, that's one and way then, it's going to uh, affect. At the workforce level, there's a good comment here that I would need to get my refrigeration license to do. A heat pump potentially. So now that's a uh, you know kind of like I was saying a, a a workforce change, a change in a change in the trades really to be able to snap your fingers and have everything electrified. Uh, you may need to you know change the skill set, and that's not going to happen overnight either. In places that you need that uh, you know a license to to do that type of work. Uh, a, education. Oh, go ahead. Got, yeah, there's talk going on. There's going to be a meeting at a, a shuttered. Uh, coal plant in uh, Wyoming and they're thinking about turning that into one of the nuclear one of the new nuclear technology plants and stuff because you got to have uranium people say well nuclear that could be somewhere well it, it needs fuel still and you got to mine that fuel and you got to process that fuel before it can be nuclear energy so that would need to be close to the site and there is uranium available in uh, Wyoming near that uh, where that one coal plant that's been shuttered so that's an option too if they can get that technology a little bit safer a little bit quicker to get it online and put it somewhere where there's a uh, you know access to the resource um, that might be uh, making a comeback too yeah definitely and then an educational piece so ownership uh, stakeholders building staff so if anyone here has installed a, a heat pump water heater and had a customer say, hey, hey, wait a second, there's no hot water yet. And you have to tell them, oh, you're gonna have to wait a minute. That That's not just gonna get that tank up to temperature in, in five minutes. Um, that is a change in expectations that as an industry, we would have to communicate well, or people are gonna think that we're not doing our job well, that a you know, heat pump water heater may take some time to get up to temperature. And it's uh, it's not a copy and paste uh, the same way just replacing a gas water heater with a, another gas water heater would be yeah max i i don't know if i've ever seen so many uh uh so many questions typed into the questions box before i think this is a new record we we need to do some the research count is high yeah yeah it's it's pretty insane um but I did have one thing that I wanted to add or a couple things that I wanted to add in here too. Um, you know, you saw that big drop in energy consumption in the year 2020, and I, I know where that came from. It was actually me yelling at my kids to turn off the lights every time they left a room. Uh, that that accounted for all the energy savings there. But the other one that came up uh, that I thought was really interesting, and, and I see it a lot now, you know, people talked in here about uh, the idea that refrigerant can hold more energy than than water. And, and, you know, you talk about VRF and, and everything else and, and versus hydronics and all that other fun stuff. The, the biggest thing that I see as a, being a big disadvantage for, for large scale VRF is just the potential for refrigerant leaks. Um, you know, you talk about asphyxiation and you talk about safety and things like that. Obviously, water leaks can cause a huge issue, but not nearly as much as, as refrigerant. Refrigerant, you know, you don't smell it, you don't see it, you could be asphyxiated and you don't even know it. Um, you know, so they, we're seeing in a lot of areas too where they're requiring refrigerant leak sensors and things like that in like hotel rooms if they're doing like large-scale VRF because I mean there could be hundreds of pounds worth of refrigerant in that system and uh, if you have one leak in one particular room that could be a huge issue whereas water obviously somebody's gonna see it or feel it sooner or later so and that's something that there are a lot of you know uh, like a commercial radiant heating and cooling project I would put you know with whatever a DOAS or something doing the you know the latent uh, heat. I would put that toe-to-toe -to -toe with any 
system as far as energy efficiency goes um, because you're also transferring the energy in the space with water still too because with the VRF if you're just going to blow you know, air across it so we, we've lost that you know the, the conveyor belt as I think uh, Siggy says for BTUs we're not using that anymore and I think that water is the best way to get it all the way to where the person is standing uh, in the space as efficiently as possible but again there's no a VRF may make a ton of sense for another place um, but I think that in general that that low temperature hydronics is just a time tested way to use energy well and is something that the the group can can do definitely on this call okay so let's see anything else you want to uh, there was just some talk in here about um, biomass fuels and hydrogen. I mean, any any thoughts on that, Max? So biomass is one that uh, I always think is kind of interesting because uh, it burns dirtier than coal in some <laughs> cases. But the argument is that if it's you know done properly, that you're letting the you know the trees or whatever you cut down recover, and you're able to harvest that, that it's soaking up as much carbon as it emits when you're burning, and it's a, a you know a zero balance thing. I don't really know where the the answer is there. Um, what side of the the truth that's on? Uh, there may be some other biomass that would just end up in a landfill that could be burned, and maybe that's uh, that's not a bad idea. Uh, I think that big picture we just have to decide what is appropriate to burn and what isn't what would be a better option to do something uh, i always think that renewable energy as much as we can leverage that is the best way to to solve that um, because that's uh, the, just for the you know, earth that we live on i think that's the best solution that we have regardless of what happens in the mechanical room uh, the more renewable something locally that we can do is going to be uh, the best, you know, future that we can give to uh, our kids. I think so. This isn't some sort of uh, Mad Max Fury Road landscape uh, because we burned everything inefficiently too fast. And I'm not saying that we don't, you know, we should never have burned fossil fuels or anything like that. I just think that we have the cheap technology to do renewables better now than we have in the past, and we should uh, leverage that as much as is is feasible, at least while the the group of us are alive. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I mean, there, man, it's, it's, I can't even keep up with how many things are being typed in here, guys. So the, well, let me look, cycle through the last uh, housekeeping slides and then we can uh, keep sure. looking at questions after that. So here's our tech support team. Uh, if you give us a call, these are uh, the people that are going to help uh, through the issues. We love talking to you about specific projects and uh, the, the talent on the Kalefi roster is, is really high as far as working through troubleshooting stuff. Uh, these two, uh, Dan and Greg, have a podcast where they talk about some of the calls that we get and uh, how to use different products and what troubleshooting things they see all the time. And then Cody, who is helping me with the questions today, has a series, Five Things You Need to Know. This is great for contractors and engineers, short amount of time, and addresses you know things like DHW research creep that are really tricky, and for five minutes, you may really save a ton of troubleshooting time. <laughs> I think it's a, a great five minutes to, to help you out in the field. Uh, follow us on these social handles. Um, we love to see your job sites uh, on uh, Instagram and things like that. And that takes me to the end here. So uh, we can stay on the call and go over a couple more questions if we want to. Uh, but if not, catch us uh, next month. John Siegenthaler is gonna be back talking about the, the topic with the heat exchangers that's in the next hydronics that will be uh, on the internet in the next couple of weeks and then at your doorstep soon if you have a, a hard copy mailed to you. Uh, what else, Cody? What else should we wrap up with? Yeah, I mean, we still got a, quite a few people on here. Um, there was uh, uh, just some talk about electronic ve or electric vehicles and everything like that too and, and energy requirements. Uh, whereas, you know, normally, you know, uh, you have your off peak times at night, you know, when everybody's sleeping, but now all of a sudden EVs will switch that to where your peak times are going to be when everybody's sleeping and your cars are charging, you know, and, and things like that and, and, uh, switching it more towards during the day because solar PV is going to be more prevalent. I, I think that's an interesting one there too. So. Yeah, I think that that the grid, the a big weakness of the grid is that everybody's trying to use the energy at the same time. So they're trying to you know get people off peak by price 
Um, but the more of this that we could do uh, to you know, heat uh, a tank to store some energy with electric off peak and then distribute that through the day, uh, that might be a way to you know, reduce some of that, that burden where they have to bring on the, the peaker plants, the, the fossil fuel burning peaker plants to keep up with that 3 p.m. hot day in uh, Southern California or something like that. But if we're able to you know, charge up a battery of some sort, if it's an electric battery or a thermal battery in a tank, uh, in, in order to not have everything using as much power as possible right at that, in that brownout situation in the afternoon, that's going to help a lot. It doesn't make the grid smart, but it does make the uh, the users a little bit uh, smarter, I guess, use of uh, their kilowatt hour dollar, um, and that may be a piece of it. But again, this this battery technology is a key thing that we're missing here to be able to just store a day's worth of energy in your house um, would be pretty substantial for everything that we've talked about here. Uh, and yeah, we definitely we need somebody to be the hero and come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, you know, you talk about storage and things like that. Batteries are a big one, um, you know, but you even think about buffer tank and big storage tanks for, for solar thermal or biomass and, and even um, uh, ice storage for chilled water applications is another big one where they, they basically freeze this huge vat of ice, you know, into the, and then they use that to level out the peaks during the day for, for cooling requirements. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways to, to take care of a lot of these problems. And I, yeah, I think this is, it's just figuring out which one's going to work best for you. So. Yeah. And I think it's just, uh, it's always super interesting to see where people find, you know, wasted energy in, in DC, they have a water treatment plant that they put a heat exchanger on to just, uh, you know, close the loop, obviously, but <laughs> to scrub some of the, the heat out of the sewage that's coming through that is, is warm and is, you know, the definition of waste. But at the same time, they can, uh, there's, I'll have to look up the case study. There's a, I think that the water treatment plant building itself uh, takes a lot of their sensible heating and cool or heating right out of the, the energy that's flowing through the building. Uh, and I think that that's pretty awesome too, that just the, a bigger version of the little heat exchange, exchanger that wraps around your, uh, you know, shower drain to take some of that 120 degree heat and put it back into your domestic tank or something like that. There's so much waste that you see every day uh, that could just be put into something, <laughs> some sort of battery or back sure. into the grid potentially. So, For sure. Well, um, Bob, I don't know. Bob, do you have anything else to add there too? No, I think this is a, 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 day. a lot of good. Yeah, I've been watching the questions too. As many good comments as there were questions there. Uh, Steve out in uh, the Bay Area talked about uh, district systems coming back a little bit where you can put, you know, uh, a system maybe by a, take advantage of the waste heat from a server farm or something like that and, and start a district system somewhere near that. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, people are thinking for sure. I can tell by the uh, responses and the questions and the comments. So that's that's what we want. That's the, the goal here is to get people thinking about uh, other ways of doing or better ways of doing things. So thanks everybody for well, yeah, and to just kind of wrap it up, this is definitely uh, a very early conversation, at least on the the Kalefi team about this topic. So it's something that we plan on having uh, you know more webinars and Hydronics uh, pieces to talk about this because uh, if anybody thought we were going to solve this in this webinar or that I wasn't going to offend <laughs> somebody with the the different directions that we could go, uh, it's not possible. So we have to keep talking about this, but we have the potential to do a lot of good here. So. Um, Keep up the good work. Uh, we'll look through the questions that we didn't uh, get to in the presentation today, and we'll see you next month for uh, John Siegenthaler. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Max. Thanks, everybody. Bye.